to go into the column. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, Professor. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's go, let's get going. Uh, anything left over from last time that you want to raise? Okay, so uh, today we're going to continue with uh, uh, the uh, the struggle of the uh, of the Dutch Republic and its triumph, and then we're going to turn our attention to the history of France um, under successive kings uh, from the 16th to the beginning of the 18th century. So we saw last time that uh, the Netherlands, and at this point, Belgium and Holland were basically part of the same entity. And we saw under the, uh, the rule of Charles V, part of his empire, and the most prosperous uh, part of it, as a matter of fact. Um, but uh, this was jeopardized when uh, Charles V was succeeded by Philip II. Charles had, uh, in return for tax revenues from this uh, very buoyant, I would call it early capitalist society, Antwerp had become uh, the uh, center of the European economy by the 1530s. Um, Charles had derived a lot of uh, money, which he was able to use politically and militarily from the Netherlands. So he left them alone. And in the Netherlands, the people of the cities, of which there were many, uh, there was uh, a huge amount of trade, manufacturing, uh, small farmers in the countryside were commercializing their land and were becoming small scale capitalists. Uh, so you have a, a, essentially a buoyant capitalist economy. But when Philip II came to the throne, he was uh, disturbed by the fact that uh, being uh, a Spanish king, uh, Spain by this point was ruled uh, under absolute government and uh, the Counter-Reformation Church with its Inquisition was uh, basically uh, uh, sort of reinforcing the power of the Spanish monarchy. He decided to impose the system on the Netherlands, which of course by this point uh, was filled with heretics and where people of the towns enjoyed a lot of privileges. So he tried to crack down and uh, this set off a revolution in Holland, which began in 1566. Uh, the Calvinists led the revolution, uh, but uh, even uh, uh, there were also Mennonites uh, there. Uh, uh, there were Lutherans, uh, but uh, it was the Calvinists that took the lead and um, uh, they resisted. Well, Philip responds by sending in the Spanish army, which was the best army in Europe. And as I was explaining last time, he succeeded in uh, reconquering the southern part of the Netherlands, which was re-Catholicized and which ultimately turned into the state of Belgium, a Catholic state. But in the north, the northern provinces led by the province, the large province of Holland, they, can, they under the leadership of the Calvinists continued to resist. Are there any questions about what I've said? And by the 1580s, uh, this northern part had formally seceded from its allegiance to Philip II and 
had set up a republic. Uh, the Republic of, uh, of Holland came into existence. In other words, a new, uh, different form of government, no longer under a king, but a Republican form of government, self-government, you can say, in which, of course, uh, the Calvinists and the leading capitalists dominated. And I want to say something about uh, more general about this because uh, it um, is important to sort of grasp. Um, this uh, was what uh, one considers to be a capitalist and middle class revolution, bourgeois revolution, capitalist and bourgeois revolution, uh, in the sense that underlying this revolt lay the growth of capitalism in the low countries, as I've explained. And of course, the leaders of this movement, the leaders of this new economic system were uh, the bourgeoisie. And most of them, as a matter of fact, were Calvinists at the same time. Uh, so, and we saw some of the immediate reasons, the attempt to impose uh, Catholicism, the attempt to impose absolute government uh, uh, was resisted by this uh, new capitalist and bourgeois class. Now, as a matter of fact, this uh, revolution in Holland, in, in the Low Countries, was the first of three great revolutions that marked uh, the early modern period. Here we see the first of them is the Dutch uh, Revolution. Uh, but then uh, you'll see that in the middle of the 17th century, a revolution broke out in England uh, between 1640 and 1660. Uh, the, king, the king's authority was overthrown and England also became a republic temporarily. And the last of these revolutions is, of course, and the one which with, with which we conclude this course uh, was the French Revolution, uh, which began in 1789. And all three of these were capitalist and bourgeois revolutions. Now, I want to say a little bit about what a revolution is all about, what these revolutions were all about in, in a more fundamental sense. What had happened, basically, is that uh, already in Holland, but we'll see the same thing happens in England and later in France. Uh, capitalism grew stronger and stronger. The middle class got stronger and stronger, but it collided with the reality that uh, the state as it existed was dominated by uh, absolute monarchy, uh, the so, uh, co uh, sort of coordinated uh, power of the Catholic Church. Um, and of course, in back of that is uh, feudalism and the landlord class in all three cases. And what happened was uh, that the middle class with its uh, capitalist economy they began to feel that they were blocked in the further advance of their social and economic objectives. Uh, uh, a, a more uh, an economy, a sort of a political structure and a social structure that was more open to the further development of capitalism and also uh, a state which instead of taxing too much and inhibiting the development of capitalism would actually favor it. And so basically this is a, what happens in Holland. And then later on, as you'll see in um, England and later uh, still in France. So what happens is that the social and political structure impedes the development of what we call the productive forces in society. And uh, when that happens, it sets the stage for revolution. It sets the stage for, for revolution. 
Are there any questions about what I've said? Professor, um, yeah. could you maybe talk about um, the revolution in England from 1640 to 1660, where you said they, they became a republic for a short time? Well, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but I don't mind. Oh. Okay. I don't mind. Yes, uh, uh, what happened uh, is more or less the same thing. Uh, in England, uh, as you'll see, capitalism uh, develops uh, strongly. As a matter of fact, England is a larger state, a more populated state than Holland. And um, while Holland, as you'll see, becomes a very strong capitalist economy following this revolution, uh, England is even stronger. And in the face of that, the English monarchy, the landed class, and the established Anglican Church, they resist. So basically, a, uh, uh, the, the middle class, uh, whose ideology is Calvinism or Puritanism, uh, basically overthrows the whole structure. And they establish a republic. And uh, so it's, a, it's a, uh, essentially a repeat of what first happens in Holland. Uh, did you want a further clarification? Yeah, I was just wondering how it kind of got back to being a monarchy. Oh, yes, that's interesting. Well, what happened was that in the case of England, um, there was, um, first of all, well, what happened was in the wake of this revolution made by the middle class, the lower middle class and the small working class, uh, they were the rank and file of the, of the revolution. Uh, in other words, the mass behind the revolution were the lower middle class and the uh, small working class. And as the revolution developed, they be began to say, well, oh, oh we uh, parliament and the merchant class and the capitalists, that's fine but we have our own interests, so we want political democracy. There developed a large, in the town, especially in London, a large movement of basically demanding um, a political democracy. Some even advocated socialism, but uh, that was quite small. But they, uh, uh, there was a demand from the lower classes for democracy. In the face of this, the, the, uh, the people who made the revolution, the middle class said, uh, this is dangerous, uh, we don't want it. And so we need to bring back the king. And so they did bring back, bring back the king. Only the king, instead of having absolute powers, now uh, accepted uh, that he was a constitutional king under the control of the parliament. But I'll explain this further when we deal with England. Uh, is that clear? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Uh, very in other words, the development of more radical elements within the revolution uh, led the people who led the revolution decided, well, this has gone too far. Kind of backtrack. Yes, so they backtracked. That's what happened. OK, that wow, thank you. That became the system in England to this day. Now, I want to make a further point, might as well. Um, I noticed that the, the, um, uh, the government in Quebec has just introduced a bill, a bill specifically directed to ensuring the free speech of professors in the university. This is happening in Quebec right now. Well, we need that across Canada because uh, the free speech, and, and when I say free speech, I don't, I'm not limiting to professors, it's under attack. I'm not gonna go into the reasons. Uh, maybe you, you, some of you who are politically aware understand this, but believe me, uh, the uh, free speech in Canada is seriously under attack, uh, especially because we're in a war situation now, and on circumstances of war, you can forget uh, the, the, the powers that be do not like free speech. But I'm, in a general way, I'm not gonna get specific, 
I'm going to talk about the moment that we're living in right now. And the moment that we're living in right now is one in which I could say that the, uh, the further development of what is sometimes referred to as the forces of production, that is to say the overall development of society, I don't mean simply economic growth. I mean the development of the overall uh, sort of potentiality of the existing society we are living in is blocked by the existing social and political institutions of this society. Uh, that is to say, the rich capitalists, the corporation, uh, the military, the, um, the political elites in this country, and this is worldwide situation, basically uh, they want to keep things as they are. But the truth of the matter is that the productive capacity of society, the creative capacity of society is blocked as I'm speaking. And so what you're seeing in this world is all kinds of conflicts all kinds of morbid symptoms. People are, are doing all kinds of crap, uh, bad things. And there is an overall malaise in the society. And it's this basic conflict between the existing political and social order and the underlying forces, which lie behind what we're experiencing. And how this will resolve itself, I don't know. One way, is we could see, see this society that we're living in go to ruin. We could have generalized war, nuclear war, ecological ruin, or somehow we can overcome the people who are the institutions that are blocking the way forward for not only ca Canadian society, but world civilization. Uh, so we could, we could have, uh, a reversion to a complete dystopia, a Mad Max running mile, wild, or something else would be created. I have no idea how it's going to turn out, but I think you should know that basically this is our situation. To return now to, uh, uh, unless you want to discuss what I said. Okay. Um, so this is the first of what we call the middle-class revolutions, the Dutch revolution. And um, the revolution led to the creation of a new state, which instead of blocking the middle class, the new state began to support. It was based on a sort of uh, 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 kind of legislative assembly in which middle-class people were represented, they dominated. And so the laws that were passed, instead of blocking uh, the further development of Holland, uh, they uh, supported it. And the result was they were able to resist the Spaniards. Um, uh, they developed an, uh, so no, a Dutch army, and particularly a Dutch navy, which wreaked havoc on the Spanish empire, as I explained. Um, and the war lasted a long time between Spain and Holland. We talk about 1566, it was only really over in 1609. It was a 50 years war that went on. Uh, and this was, we could consider uh, the first of what I would call a war of national liberation because the Dutch developed the nationalism, they developed a whole sort of ideology around what they were doing. Uh, and also, the, if you can believe it, in the midst of the war, especially because their, their naval and merchant power, the Dutch economy began to grow more and more. Right in the middle of the war, uh, the city of Amsterdam uh, became the center of world commerce and manufacturing. Amsterdam took the place of Antwerp, which was down in Belgium, we can call it. Um, and so uh, the, 
in the middle of this war, Holland became stronger and stronger. And furthermore, in 1585, uh, the English, under the, their queen, Queen Elizabeth, decided that uh, she would send English infantry into Holland to reinforce the Dutch economy. And so uh, the Dutch gained a, an important ally, namely England. Well, uh, Philip II, looking at this situation, decided that uh, the only way to bring Holland to, uh, to surrender and to deal with this sort of growing sort of um, sort of Dutch English alliance, but what he was really against was both of these countries by now were Protestant and their merchant classes were getting stronger and stronger. So he, he wanted to suppress this. So what he did, and I have to find, he sent a great fleet with 30,000 soldiers. He sent a great fleet from Spain northward to basically uh, invade England. Let's see if I can find this. It's known as the Spanish Armada. All told, it had 130 men of war, 130 Spanish ships, 30,000 infantry were on board waiting to land in England. And there were tw no less than 2,400 cannons. Uh, this fleet was equipped with 2,400 cannon. Um, well, the English had far fewer ships, but they were better sailors and their armaments were more sophisticated than those of the Spaniards. And so at the end of the day, in this great sea battle, one of the great sea battles of history, I already mentioned it when I, uh, I was talking about the Battle of Lepanto in the Mediterranean, if any of you can remember, the Spanish fleet was defeated in this great naval battle. And this, of course, marks the beginning of the greatness of England, the emergence of England as a serious European power. Uh, we can say the, the date is 1588. Uh, but, uh, uh, that's another story, and we'll come back to it. Are there any questions about what I've said? So the Spaniards were defeated, and their land army was bogged down in the low countries. They couldn't conquer because of the terrain in Holland. Uh, and so the war dragged on and on. And meanwhile, Spain began to run into difficulties. Spain, the power of Spain was wearing down. And in particular, from about 1610, the gold and silver resources of Latin America, which had been the basis of Spanish power, it began to run out. The productivity of the mines uh, became uh, uh, more and more marginal. And Spain ha had less gold and silver with which to fund its armies. Um, and furthermore, since, as I explained earlier, uh, starting with Ferdinand and Isabella, they had basically destroyed their manufacturing and merchant base, including the expulsion of the Jews. Uh, as a result, they had nothing to fall back on. It was only the gold and silver of Latin America that kept this whole thing going. And so what you see from about 1610 onwards is the rapid decline of Spain. Spain, which had dominated the whole 16th century, now uh, its pow uh, power begins to evaporate. It becomes the third or fourth rate power on the European scene as a result. And of course, that means that 
the by 1610, the independence of Holland is assured. And uh, alongside that, the growth of the Dutch economy, they had, as I said, uh, prospered right through the war. By 1610, uh, Holland was the leading economic power in Europe. In fact, it dominated uh, the whole of the European economy for much of the 17th century. As I explained, there was a small scale, there were a lot of small scale uh, capitalist farmers. Uh, there was a lot of fishing. There was a lot of textile and other manufacturing in, uh, in Holland. Uh, but also, they built some 10,000 merchant vessels. And Holland became absolutely the dominant in European and world uh, 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 commercial activity as a result of this economic power in the 17th century. And uh, although it was a small country, it had less than 3 million people this country, it became this uh, uh, economic giant in the uh, 17th century. Uh, England was rising, but it was still until toward the second half of the uh, 17th century, it was unable to compete with the Dutch. Um, and so uh, this becomes really the center of this emerging uh, European capitalism that we've been talking so much um, and of course, it was based uh, certainly on what was going on in Holland, but there was a tremendous amount of trade. Amsterdam was uh, absolutely uh, the uh, focal point of commerce. Uh, so we see that uh, the Dutch ships, uh, they sailed the Baltic Sea and they collected grain from Eastern Europe, from Poland, uh, they uh, drew iron ore and timber from the Scandinavian countries. They, uh, from France and Spain and the Mediterranean, uh, they drew um, uh, stuff like um, they, uh, wine, olive oil, wool, uh, spices from the Mediterranean and from the Southern European countries, all coming to Amsterdam and being exchanged by merchants from all over Europe. So this was a colossus. This is a colossal um, uh, economic power. And uh, to sort of serve this uh, manufacturing and commercial activity, they developed new, absolutely new, uh, institutions to basically uh, manipulate money, or what we can call money capital. At the beginning of the 17th century, for example, they created the first stock exchange. You have the, what we have today, the first stock exchange appeared in Amsterdam at the beginning of the 17th century. Um, they created uh, what was amount, what amounted to as a national bank, the Bank of Amsterdam. And they also created a, 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 a corporation that handled insurance. All of these merchants needed insurance on what they were trading and manufacturing. And so the first insurance companies appear. And so this is sort of the development of money, the institutions of what we call money capital appear in Holland. Other questions about what I've said? And to cap this off, in 1602, the Dutch created the first joint stock company, the so-called Dutch East India Company. This was really the first corporation in the modern sense, uh, basically a, a corporate body, which was formed by the investment 
by private investments who did not accept liability for the company. Uh, basically, they bought stock in the company uh, in, the, in the modern sense. So the Dutch East India Company comes into being as the first corporation. And uh, not only, the, obviously, by the very name, you understand that the purpose of the company, the Dutch East India Company, was to uh, basically send ships to Asia to get in on the trade with India China, Indonesia, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this was the purpose of this Dutch East India Company. And one of the most remarkable features of this company is they, uh, they had on board their many ships. They had Marines, they had cannon. They, they had their own defensive forces that accompanied the fleet. It wasn't really a, a matter of a commercial operation. It was also a military operation. And what they did was they, uh, they used the capital to equip these well-armed vessels. Uh, the Dutch East India Company invaded Asia at the beginning of the, well, it was already happening from the 1580s, but it intensified after 1600. And they basically took over the Portuguese empire. The Portuguese were left with some few remnants, but basically the Dutch took the place of the Portuguese in Asia. And they destroyed the Portuguese empire. And based on Indonesia, Java, and Maluka, and so on, uh, which of course became a Dutch colony and remained so until after the Second World War, uh, based on Indonesia, but also based on the fact that they also controlled uh, Sri Lanka. They took control of Sri Lanka, or what used to be called um, Ceylon. And they also took from the Portuguese control of the Cape of Good Hope. Um, the Dutch basically came to control the Asian trade. Um, now, also they were active, the, the Dutch were active in the New World because the Portuguese had already done this in Brazil, but now in uh, Guiana and what later became Venezuela and on some of the Caribbean islands, they set up the slave sugar plantations. The Dutch went into that business as well and a quite prosperous a Dutch trade appeared there. And so you can see that uh, the Dutch in the 17th century were dominant, a small country. However, ultimately size does matter. And the population of Holland was limited. It's a small country and by the end of the 17th century, they were under a lot of pressure. To the south, uh, France had become a gigantic power under its king, Louis XIV. And at the same time, the English, especially following their revolution, had become a giant capitalist power. And both of them were enemies of the Dutch. So the Dutch were basically being squeezed from both sides. And in response to that, the Dutch, they, the only choice they had, choice they had was either to make an alliance with France or to make an alliance with England. And so it was in 1688. I'll leave the, the details aside. They basically allied with the English. They went into a partnership with the English. And this is the beginning. Um, uh, Dutch and English capitalism basically fused from that point onward. The two became partners. And uh, 
the, the glory days of Holland were over and essentially England took over. Are there any questions about this? Okay. Uh, so, what, what, sorry. Yes, sorry. Um, did the did the English like were the Dutch being like uh, how were they being squeezed from both sides? Was it like a military pressure? Was yeah. it an economic well, pressure? Uh, in, the, in the case of the uh, case of the French, it was war. Uh, the the uh, the the armies of Louis XIV invaded the Low Countries and invaded Holland, and they were fighting the the Dutch could scarcely resist. They needed English help. In the case of the English, it was commercial wars. Uh, commerce, the words for dominance, especially on the high seas. Naval okay. wars. But uh, that, that was the character of it. So, okay, thank you. Okay. So um, what I'd like to do now is basically turn uh, having given you this account of um, uh, Holland in the uh, late 16th and 17th century, I want to now turn to France, which developed in, in a completely different way uh, because uh, there uh, the landed aristocracy, the established Catholic Church, and the monarchy, which was increasingly an absolute centralizing monarchy, they, uh, although uh, certainly capitalist forces began to develop in France from the 16th century onwards and continued, uh, capitalism was weaker, the middle class was weaker than it was in Holland and England. And so what you find is uh, basically the growing power of the monarchy um, supported by the established Catholic Church and the landed aristocracy continued to rule uh, through various permutations as you'll see this there are all sorts of things that happen internally and externally but they continued to rule and the middle class is only able to pa take power to develop enough internal force uh, at the time of the French Revolution, at the end of the 18th century, 1789, which is really the beginning, we can say, of uh, the end of early modern history and the beginning of modern history. The real date of that is 1789. This is the last of the three great revolutions I've been speaking about, and it completely transformed Europe. It's a revolution which is deeper, more profound uh, than the preceding Dutch and English revolutions. But we'll get to that uh, uh, later. What I'm now describing is basically the development of um, France uh, uh, from the 16th until the beginning of the 18th century. And so we begin with the fact that uh, as you will perhaps recall, I don't know if you can, that in the first part of the uh, 16th century, like Spain and like England under Henry VIII, you have a powerful monarchy. Francis I, you'll recall, with his court, um, with uh, the parliament, uh, with the standing army, the French state is a formidable force, not as formidable as Spain, more powerful than England, uh, and very determined to maintain its independence, especially against the threat of Spanish Habsburg Charles V power, you understand. Um, so you have this powerful monarchy, but in the second half of the 16th century, uh, the power of the, of the king suddenly fell apart and France fell into a civil war between 1562 and 1598. There was a civil war in France. Who are on the both on either side? Well, France, like uh, other places, like Holland, 
sorry, like the Low Countries, the opposition was between the Protestants and the Catholics. It was a religious civil war, 1562 to 1598. The, the Reformation, the Calvinists on the one side, the uh, Counter-Reformation Catholics on the other. And it was a bitter thing. Several million people died in these wars. And in these wars, the nobility, which was the dominant class, they were divided. There were uh, Catholic nobles, there were Protestant nobles. And they were leading the armies, the Catholic army versus the Protestant army. But below them, the rest of the population, the peasants and the townsmen also divided up according to uh, basically uh, religion. But you should understand, yes, these were religious wars, but also there were, there were social elements. There was a lot of complaints on the part of the common people against the excessive taxation of the monarchy. Religion became an excuse for people uh, to revolt and not pay their taxes to the king. So uh, it was a complex matter, these religious wars. Well, they went on and on and said they were extremely disruptive. Uh, several million people died and there seemed to be no end uh, to it. So finally, there emerged uh, a leader. His name was Henry of Navarre or Henry of Navarre Bourbon who was a very charismatic figure. He was the leader of the Protestant side. And for many years, uh, he led the Protestants against the Catholics. He was a great warrior. He was much admired uh, uh, for his um, charisma. Um, he was clever and funny and so on. Uh, but he realized at the end that um, France, there were too many Catholics in the country. He would never become, uh, he would never uh, uh, become preeminent if he remained a Protestant. In 1589, the last Catholic uh, ruler, Henry III, he died. So it was a question, Henry IV was the nearest in line for the throne. But the Catholics would never allow him to become king as a Protestant. And so he decided, and this came out of the blue, he decided he announced that he was going to convert from the Protestant religion to the Catholic religion. And the way he put it was quite interesting. He said, this is a quote, Paris is worth a mass. Paris is worth a mass. Now, uh, this is a, a clever expression. Paris, of course, is the capital of France. It has a population of 350,000 people. It's a very rich city. It's the political center of Paris. And Henry wants political power, wants to become king. Uh, and the only way he can do this is to become Catholic. So he says, as a matter of fact, Paris is worth a mass. And the reason I mention this is that it does reflect a change in the atmosphere. That is to say, when this civil war began in France, and indeed we can say all over Europe, the religious division uh, between the Catholics and uh, the Protestants was paramount. People were impassioned by what we can call religious ideology. But by 1589, they were exhausted. The French were exhausted, but this was a common sort of, this, this new spirit was, was pervasive uh, across Europe in many places. Why are we fighting about uh, religion? It's not that important, or it's important, but not that important. And people more and more, especially amongst the elites, were reading Machiavelli and Machiavelli's prince, as I explained. In there, he says, uh, as a matter of fact, the popes 
basically use religion politically to gain power. So uh, the rulers begin to say, well, if a pope is doing this, why can't I do it? And so this was the new spirit uh, that began, began certainly to dominate French politics uh, from this point onward. And so having converted by 1594, Henry is recognized by the Catholics as the new king of France. So uh, he reigned from 1589 to 1610. Are there any questions about what I said? Okay. So having become king, he turns around and in order to placate the Protestants, he says he issues at the city of Nantes a, an edict of toleration, the so-called edict of Nantes, which grants the Protestants a toleration and also protection. He guarantees that the, monar the monarchy is going to protect the Protestants in France. And on this basis then, he consolidates his rule, reconsolidates the monarchy. And he, he holds a whole series of conferences trying to reconcile the Protestants and Catholics. At the same time, he using mercantilist principles, and I've explained earlier what mercantilism, state-directed economic development, he begins to rebuild the French economy during his reign. But unfortunately, uh, he is assassinated in 1610 by a Catholic fanatic. He was riding through the streets of Paris in a royal carriage. And uh, of course, it was possible to do that because he re rebuilt some of the important roads. He created new roads and bridges in Paris alongside a lot of other economic initiatives all over the country. And so he was riding in his carriage and a, uh, a Catholic fanatic by the name of Ravayak jumped onto the carriage with a dagger and stabbed him in the heart. And that was the end of Henry IV. And so um, after some permutations, the young king, Louis XI, uh, became the new ruler. And he ruled a long time, you see, 33 years. Now, Louis XIII wasn't a clever politician or a brave soldier like Henry IV, but he had the wisdom to choose as his first minister a bishop. Actually, this man was a cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church as his prime minister, uh, a man by the name of Richelieu became the prime minister and was the effective ruler of France during the period of the rule of Louis XIII. And it's he who continues the policy of Henry IV. And Richelieu, just like Henry IV, was influenced by Machiavelli. He was a cardinal. He was a cardinal of the, of the church. But fundamentally, what he believed in was what we call reason of state, raison d'etat. And what this amounted to was an adaptation of what Machiavelli had said. Because Machiavelli basically was all about the power of the prince, the aggrandizement of the prince, how an individual could seize power in the state. But with Vishnu, it was different. He didn't want power for himself. He wanted power for the French state. And what he basically said was the ultimate moral and political principle is reason of state. That is to say, one can do whatever is necessary in order to enhance the power and security of the French state. This doctrine is known as reason of state. By reason of state, we do whatever we do. We lie, we, uh, we attack others, whatever we, was necessary um, in order to enhance the power of the state. And uh, it was under Richelieu that 
uh, the further development of French mercantilism, the development of the French economy occurred. Um, it was under Richelieu that uh, some of the power of the independent landlords, the aristocracy was reduced and he built up the French army. And it was the French army under Richelieu that finally defeated whatever remaining power Spain had was destroyed by the French army under the direction of Richelieu. And so that brings us, uh, and here I'm bringing things to an end, following Richelieu and some uh, sort of um, relatively minor disturbances, there came to the French throne, the last and the greatest of the, uh, I would say in the series of great French kings, Louis XIV, called the Sun King, um, who had a very long reign and he brought, Spain was eclipsed, England was an island, and Louis XIV became the new Charles V. He aspired through marshalling and centralizing all power in his own hand. He tried to make France the greatest power in Europe. And we'll see how this turned out in the next class.